speaking of appetitive control, you you note how individuals who have had gastric bypass, um, while quite successful in uh, curbing appetite and ultimately food consumption, and therefore being a great tool for managing obesity and type two diabetes, are prone to higher rates of alcoholism. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that? And 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 ultimately what I want to really talk about is this new class of drugs that have been introduced, uh, GLP-1 agonists, but let's just set the stage on the, uh, on the gastric bypasses. Yeah. So about a quarter of individuals undergoing gastric bypass for obesity, which you might conceptualize as food addiction, um, in certain vulnerable individuals, um, will go on to develop an alcohol use disorder after their gastric bypass. And that's probably operating on multiple levels. One level on which it's operating is that alcohol becomes immediately a much more potent drug for them because th through the gastric bypass, they essentially have a kind of a dumping syndrome where they get the equivalent of many more drinks because it immediately goes into the duodenum and is absorbed. So they get um, you know, where they can have one drink and immediately feel their effects. And, and part of potency is not just how much dopamine it's released, but how quickly it's released, um, which is why, for example, you know, injecting is so potentially addictive because it's basically right to the brain. Um, so alcohol becomes a very potent drug for them, but also because of the problem of cross addiction, where when people give up one addictive substance or behavior, they are vulnerable to switch that addictive tendency over to another substance or behavior. And so unless we're directly addressing the problem of the behavioral addiction itself, at the same time that we're addressing uh, the obesity and doing the, the, the bypass surgery, folks are going to be vulnerable to that. Yeah. So, so, so what has been your experience clinically with the significant increase we've seen in the use of GLP-1 agonists and the expansion in use from uh, type 2 diabetes to obesity to overweight to, you know, basically anybody. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, there have been a lot of reports that GLP-1 agonists not only curb appetite, which is the desired outcome, but may in fact also curb desire and maybe even pleasure. And that would actually suggest that unlike a gastric bypass, an individual who uses a GLP-1 agonist to achieve their weight loss goals might also have another benefit in that it might curb other maladaptive behaviors such as alcohol consumption. Um, so just kind of curious as to what you've seen as the as the field is still quite nascent in our understanding, but but obviously you're, you, you're probably the canary in the coal mine for some of these things. Yeah. So, I mean, these are really fascinating drugs. And what we are seeing clinically is individuals with food addiction and individuals with alcohol addiction, alcohol use disorder, which, by the way, is closely linked to food addiction because alcohol is caloric. So we've got both mediated through the carbohydrate system. Individuals with, at least in the cases where, where we have experimented off-label, uh, with the semaglutide, the GLP-1, um, you know, drugs. Um, these individuals have tried almost everything to get their addiction under control. And I would say more, we have more experience with treatment refractory alcohol use disorder, including trying medications, right? Medications like baclofen, uh, medications like uh, naltrexone, Medications I, did, like I didn't know to, about uh, baclofen. So tell me, baclofen, the muscle yeah. relaxant, is used to treat yes. alcohol disorder? Yeah. So there are more placebo-controlled trials in Europe than here in the U.S. It's not FDA approved for that indication. It's not first line for us, but we will sometimes use bac baclofen. Sometimes you, we'll use gabapentin. What doses of, of baclofen and gabapentin are, are necessary to produce that effect? Well, gabapentin, we usually... I, I will say I, I'm using less gabapentin than I used to mm -hmm. because we've been seeing people actually get physically dependent in some cases addicted to gabapentin. Mm -hmm. But typically we'll use the 600 milligrams three times a day to help people withdraw from alcohol and in some cases um, maintenance, although less of that. I don't use baclofen often enough to tell you what mm -hmm. the doses. I, I have to look it up. Um, but but those are those, I would say more often we're using naltrexone, the opioid receptor blocker which can be very nice because 
Uh, many people's goal is moderation, not just abstinence. And naltrexone's been helped, been shown to help not just with abstinence, but also re reducing drinks on drinking days. So that's very nice. We, we use that almost as first line. We use antabuse, disulfiram, which is the one that's a deterrent. If you drink on it, you'll get sick. People don't usually like to go to that first line, but it, it works when people take it. We use things like topiramate. It should be pointed out that if patients do use that and drink through it, they are actually increasing the toxicity of alcohol gram for yes. gram because they're experiencing more acetaldehyde, which is the obviously the toxic mediator. Yes, exactly. So you really have to be careful who you prescribe it to, and it has to be somebody who can, can really be committed to not drinking what once they've taken that medication. Um, we also use topiramate, which is a seizure medication, which was first discovered off-label to be helpful for binge eating disorder and um, later was shown to be helpful for alcohol use disorder. But the bottom line is when we have a case of a patient who has tried these various medications, who's been involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, who's tried psychotherapy, who's gone to rehab, who's done it all, um, in that rare instance, because it is off-label and because it's so new, and so we, we're conservative with medications, we will occasionally, we have occasionally recommended semaglutide or the GLP-1 um, drugs. And um, in one case in particular, it was very striking the extent to which this individual with treatment refractory alcohol use disorder endorsed the complete cessation of alcohol craving mm. um, with... Uh, semaglutide. And, you know, it's it's very moving to see that in an individual who has struggled so long and so hard uh, to battle their addiction. And then there's this drug that seems to um, just suddenly turn off all the noise for them. Was that patient at all overweight? Yes. And so that's how we could justify it, I right? See. Because uh, uh, he, he, we were giving it to him for being overweight for um, not having type 2 diabetes, but being at risk for I type see. 2 diabetes. Um, but but the, our real agenda was the alcohol, yeah. and it worked very well for that. Do, do you think that we'll ever be able to explore um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a rigorous scientific way the question of whether or not independent of weight, GLP-1 agonists might be tools to help people with addictions more broadly? beginning with alcohol even before we talk about <clears throat> other substances oh yeah so those those trials are those small trials are already underway um okay. and showing some effect so i i would not be at all surprised if in 5 to 10 years semaglutide is fda approved for alcohol use disorder I, it might not happen because the the company doesn't need it um and it's expensive to get those fda approvals and there's no shortage of demand for some glutide. Um, so, uh, you know, they may never pursue that FDA indication, but um, I think that it will be used more and more often uh, for alcohol use disorder in particular and binge eating disorder. Mm -hmm.